so I think it's it's good to get started. Uh, so welcome everybody to uh, to this uh, show and tell, uh, which is about type-based formal verification. And the goal is to give you a very broad overview of of what there is there. Uh, and my hope is to you know uh, uh, be able to to get people interested on this and and hopefully been able to use some of these tools in our daily job. So, uh, I mean, part of the talk is going to be what can we do now and what, you know, for what we need more to learn. Uh, so just to give you a very start, so formal verification itself is like an incredibly huge field. Uh, and the core idea is always the same. You have a program and then you have a specification and then you want to check that you know, your program satisfies a specification, where a specification is whatever you can think about a program that it's uh, as far as it needs to be, it doesn't break, uh, whatever. Uh, and you can do this at very different moments in your, in your uh, building process. You can uh, mobile your software uh, at the very beginning. You can have formal verification, which works as part of coding. Or you can write your program and then say, well, I want to verify this against a spec. So you do this afterwards as an additional spec. Uh, and as I said, this is a very huge field. So you have uh, some approaches which try to explore all different states in your program. Some other use types or similar annotations. Some use specialized logic. So uh, for example, if you want to talk about things that happen after another or things that happen uh, eventually you use something called temporal logics and so on uh, so all of this formal verification is, is a really really huge even if you look at at academia uh, there is not such a thing as a formal verification conference there is like many of those uh, so from all of those i'm just gonna talk a bit about uh, some things you can do if you use types so uh, types have been called sometimes the most successful lightweight formal verification method. I mean, even, even very old languages have types and we don't even think now of, of them about formal verification. But if you think about it, well, that's, that, that tells you how you should treat the words in memory. You know, is this an integer? Is this a string? Is this a pointer? So in some sense, it's like a very, very lightweight formal verification. And the core ideas of types is that every value has a type. And then using something of one type as another type is wrong. And what it means to be as another type depends on the language. So if you have like a, a, a language with subtyping like a Scala, then, well, you can use something as something of its parent class. And also when you raise the, the problem, is also depending on the language. You have static, uh, statically typed programming languages like Haskell, Scala, Java, where you want to find out about these problems at compile time. And you have other languages which also have types like Lisp or Python, uh, but you only get problems at runtime. So, uh, but this idea of typing is, is there in any way. So uh, yeah, the other thing is that I'm, I'm gonna use Haskell and Haskell-like programming languages in this talk. So just uh, to give a very few tidbits that you need to know, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to show you three snippets of code. So uh, the first of all, this is how you define a data type. This is how you define a list in Haskell. And you should read this as you define a list of A's uh, by two constructor. One is nil, which creates a list. And then the other is cons, which given a value of type A and another list creates a list. So uh, if you would use in a Scala, this is, the list would be essentially the, the, the parent abstract class and each of these things would be a case class and in Kotlin something, something similar to it. In Haskell, we define all of them at once. Uh, if you're writing functions in Haskell, uh, you have an implicit pattern match at the top, which means you don't have to write, you know, you don't have to write match uh, when you start a, uh, a function, you have it there. So if you want to define the length of the list before 
I can just say length of nil is zero, length of a cons is one plus the length of the tail, which is x's. And, and then finally, Haskell has this uh, thing where you write type signatures separate from the implementation. So if you want to say what is the type of length, you write something like the theme below. So you write length, take a list of A, and returns an integer. And these four dots uh, are usually read as type of or has type. Uh, another thing which you can see which is different from uh, Scala or Kotlin is that you don't have to say which are the type variables. So you don't have to include like an A in brackets or angle brackets when you define length as you would do in any of the other languages. Instead of that, anything which starts with lowercase is implicitly quantified. So this A is like you have written, you know, you have said that this works for any A. Uh, oh, by the way, if you have any question, feel free to like uh, uh, write in the chat and I'll try to, to answer it as we go. Okay, so this is all, all you need to know. Uh, so what is the problem here is that, you know, types are great, but types sometimes lie. So you have functions like head in Haskell, which, which uh, you know, take a list and returns the first element of the list. But what happens if the list is empty? Or if you, you have a function like division where you take two integers and return an integer or just think with, with any numbers you like, what should happen if the second argument is zero? So none of these functions are protecting you from doing the wrong thing. And actually Haskell answer is throw an exception and I'm not kidding, Haskell just throws an exception you sh can catch and whatever. So, uh, you know, types are great, but sometimes, you know, types will lie. So the, the, usual, the usual things we do to fix this is we either strengthen the requirements for the argument. So we say, well, head can only work on a non-empty list and division should only work if the second argument is a non-zero integer, or we can have errors in the result. We can say like, well, head uh, returns a maybe, which is like how we call optionals in, in Haskell, uh, because maybe I'm having an empty list and I cannot give you back the, the value, or division can, return a divide by zero error. So this either, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure how it's called in other languages, but it is you, you can either get an integer or one of these divide by zero errors. But this has some problems. And the problem is that you need to check and recheck the conditions. So if you think about using this divide which returns an either, even if you know things are correct, if you have checked before that, that your integer is not zero, you are forced by this type to do an extra pattern match and check that whether the either is divided by zero or not. And you know the, 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 the wrong case will never happen, but you are forced to do this. Or if you, uh, and even if you uh, are okay with checking it, this sort of blurs the happy path. So you have a bunch of nested pattern matches which are just accounting for any possible error, but you don't really want to see this in your program. Uh, Another problem with this type is that, uh, you know, we just said integer to integer, but you can make even more precise types. So you can say that division takes two positive integers and returns a positive integer or a positive and a negative and returns a negative. So how precise type should be uh, is also a problem of, of when you use types. So what we would like to have with all of these uh, more powerful type systems is to make the language aware of more invariants. So take flow of information into consideration and be aware of implications between this. So imagine that uh, we know because we have already pattern match on a list that this list is not empty. We want that head uh, is able to, to take this thing and say, well, this, this application of head is okay because I know that this list is not empty because this other information up there. Or maybe I know that the number is greater than one and this function requires something which is not zero. But if it's greater than one, it must be, it, mu it cannot be zero. So this kind of information is something we want the program to be aware of. Uh, so 
you know, we can even start doing some of these things if, if you use uh, Haskell or Scala by using what it's called uh, GDTs, which stands for Generalized Algebraic Data Types, or uh, if you want to research how academia quality is usually inductive type with indices. But the whole idea is, well, why don't we keep information about the values in the type? And here, what we are going to define is a list which remembers its length. So instead of saying, well, a list is just empty or, or a cons, what we're going to say is if the list is empty, if we have a nil, the list has zero elements. And we have this special zero type to encode this zero. If we have a list with n elements and we add one more element with the cons, then we have a list with plus one n elements. So this zero and plus one sort of account for how many elements we have in the list. So by recording this piece of information, uh, we can give a type to head, uh, which, which ensures that we will never use this with an empty list, because if, if we have at least plus one, we have a plus one uh, in the list, then we know that it's not empty, because if it was empty, then the, the first argument to list would be zero. Uh, so this is great. I mean, uh, since the type is threaded and this kind of information about the type flows around the uh, around at compile time, we know that this information about not emptiness is actually going to be maintained by the compiler. So this is this is great, and you know this is kind of the core of the idea we want to have. We want to keep more information in the types about about the values with the hope that the compiler is able to flag when we are doing something wrong or to check that we are doing everything better. Good. But this is a few problems. So uh, first of all, we have to create our own numbers. So this zero and plus one are kind of two weird types I had to create. We had to create our own list. So we cannot take a list which exists and use this. And further on, we had to specify up front that we care about its length. But what if we care about some other thing uh, from the list, why, 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 you know, care about the length? Why not care about whether the the amount of elements is is an even number? Because we, you know, we want to pair things with the next one. Maybe this is something we we want to do, and we cannot use the previous list because we only care about length there. And still, we cannot type the following function, which uh, is replicate, which says, well, give me a number and a value, and I will make you a list of as many elements as the value. So uh, here, sort of the, 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 uh, the length of the list is going to depend on a runtime value, which is the number, the, this, this first argument. So this is something we cannot type with GDTs. But people have been working on that, and we actually have solutions for this. Uh, uh, well, we. Uh, dependent types and refinement types are two ways to extend kind of our typing mechanism and uh, they have dif differences and I'm going to talk about the differences. Uh, both of them solve the problem of, of replicate uh, and then you know they have you know one uh, so dependent types doesn't need us to create our own numbers uh, but they will still need to specify what we care about in refinement types we can add new properties uh, but then we might need to create our own number. So, you know, there is always a trade-off. And I just gave there a bunch of numbers of programming languages and systems which implement these things. So for dependent types, you know, most people are aware of, of uh, Coq. And you have also Agda, which is like a Haskell-like language. And for refinement types, you have things like Liquid Haskell, or you can uh, extend the Scala with something called Stainless. So, you know, there are many things uh, to work on. Good, so let's talk about each of these things uh, in turn. So the core idea of dependent types is that the type of a result may depend on the value of the arguments. And, and uh, uh, this is different. Uh, uh, so this is exactly what we would need uh, to type replicate. So Remember that, uh, you know, if you, if you look at this replicate here, what I'm saying is that the 
the length of the list is exactly the value of the natural number n. So I'm, I'm sort of mixing values which will only happen at runtime with type which are usually thought of as being checked at compiled time. So you can see that the, the difference between values and types is blurred here. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's, this is the core idea of dependent types, as I said. You know, and this is where the name comes from. Usually in non-dependent languages, the type of something may only depend of the type of previous things. But in dependent types, the type of the result may depend on the value of the arguments. Uh, so I've, I've written this also in Agda, by the way. Uh, it's like Haskell, but you use one column instead of two columns, and you use set instead of type, just you know, to make people uh, crazy a bit. You know, this is a small syntactic thing which just exists uh, because you know some people find uh, two columns nicer than one. Uh, but as I was saying, one of the things which dependent types adds to the mix is that because, you know, uh, if you look at the replicate, the n is both a value, so it's a natural number, but it's also part of a type. So, you know, naturally, values and types are just the same thing. They live in the same world. There is no distinction. There is no type level or term level. In dependent types, they are just the same thing. And this has a few implications. The main, the main one is that now you can use functions in types because, you know, uh, you can have values, so you just can do things with those values while applying to the types. So uh, the typical example is trying to type something like the append function. So if you have a, a list of m elements and a list of n elements, and you append both, what you get is a list of m plus n elements. And this m plus n is actually the plus function. So it's not something different. It's independent types. You just define your plus function. And then you, uh, you can use this plus function as part of another type. So, you know, this is, you know, everything just uh, uh, works together to be able to do this. Uh, but there are a few cons of doing this. So first of all is that during, during type checking, we have to run function. And this can take you some time, you know, because you are actually running functions and you have to be aware that, you know, this function might fail or whatever. And, and also any type inference is out of the question. So you have to be very specific about your type when you write uh, dependent type things. Which, you know, it's in any way, it's a good thing. You should be kind of uh, explicit about these kind of things. So, you know, this is dependent types. Just, just to, to say it again, the point is that you can replicate, you can write things like append here where you can, you know, take numbers and put them as part of a type and then you can have functions which run in the types and so on. Uh, the other kind of uh, type-based verification I want to talk about is refinement types. And the core idea of refinement types is this types are augmented by predicates. So every, every time you have a type, you can also say something about the values in the type. So it's kind of a, a Boolean condition. So here I'm changing language again. I'm going back to Haskell uh, and extended by something called liquid Haskell. Uh, uh, so, uh, so in liquid Haskell, you just write Haskell and then you add annotations between these weird kind of uh, uh, braces with uh, add signs. Uh, but well, let, let's just look at the examples. Uh, this is how you define a predicate by putting things between the square braces. So if we look, if we look at the type of head, this tells us, uh, well, head takes a list, A, and we are going to refer to this value as V. And then the length of V must be greater than zero. And below you can see the, the, the usual Haskell type, which doesn't talk about, about the length at all. Or if we have division, the liquid Haskell annotation tell us it takes an integer and then an integer which is not zero and give back an integer. So, you know, we are sort of extending our type languages, our type language with, with these Boolean conditions. So if we have this conditions in arguments, we are defining precondition. If we have uh, them over the result, we are defining post conditions. So for example, if we have something like the type of append, 
we can say, well, we take an X and a Y, and then we return a V, and the length of V must be equal to the length of X plus the length of Y. Uh, so you can see that uh, refinement types also get a bit of, of dependencies. Uh, so you can, you, can refer, uh, you can refer to previous arguments, but you know, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, it's not exactly the same. You know, there are some technical differences, but you can still refer to, to conditions on the previous stuff. Uh, good, so, uh, yeah, somebody is asking whether refinement types are application of horror logic, uh, right? So, uh, I'm not pretty sure about whether, what's the relation between horror logic and this. So uh, in horror logic, it's, it's kind of a logic where you specify preconditions and postconditions, then you specify like triples of those things. Uh, I'm sure there must be some relation, but uh, I'm, I'm not, I've, I cannot answer this question uh, exactly. So, you know, uh, good. Uh, so refine, one of the nice things of refinement types, or at least about the implementations we, we see in Haskell and Scala is that you can specify new properties after the fact. So this length of a list doesn't have to be written while we define the list data type. We can just say, well, length is, is a new property. And uh, for, uh, for old reasons, I guess, uh, these properties in, li in liquid Haskell are called measures. Uh, but they are just, you know, properties you, you can talk about. So you, if you want to write the previous thing where I, you talk about the length of a list, you can just write uh, this, this usual length function and tell Liquid Haskell, you know, this is a property I want to care about. Please, you know, figure out how to thread this information at compile time. And uh, in, in, in most systems, uh this this kind of properties must be must be simple things and these are because they use something called smt solvers i'm going to talk about later uh and they only know about simple values like numbers and booleans but a uh, more modern system can define uh more complex properties so uh good uh Okay, somebody is asking also whether uh, Liquid Haskell, uh, you know, how do you ensure that the logic in your annotation is right? So it's it's like you're moving the logic somewhere else and it's almost as right in property tests. Uh, so, I mean, of course there is the, so now this, this goes to the general problem of how do you know that your specification is specifying what you want to specify. So this is, you know, a problem which is general to, to any of these formal verification things. Uh, but yes, in many cases, what you end up writing is like property tests. So, but instead of, you know, randomly checking that some of these, uh, you know, randomly generating values and checking that the property holds, this is actually formally verifying that it holds one and for all. So if it compiles, that means that you don't, you no longer need your property test because you know, the thing has already been verified to satisfy this property. So you can, you can say that, you know, it's, it's like you take, you can take your test and if you make, and if you can turn them into something that liquid Haskell can check, then you can throw your, your test uh, to the bin because you already know that this thing will always be satisfied. Uh, yeah. And by the way, this liquid Haskell stuff is also available in Scala. Uh, uh, so, uh, you have something called stainless, which is like a Scala, but you know, with what I find just kind of uglier syntax, but you know, uh, doesn't matter. It's, you just specify kind of the same thing. So properties are just functions with the right type and you know, you don't have to tell anything, just sort of a stainless note. It can be turned into a property. And then the type of a pen that I showed be, uh, before just becomes very similar and you have this ensuring thing which is kind of taking you uh, the, the uh, you specify the post condition. So you have something very similar to what we had before. So, you know, you ensure that the length of the result uh, is equal to the length of, to the sum of the lengths of both things. Uh, so, you know, 
in any case, this, this kind of refinement types can, can be written as annotations, can be written as extra part of the programs, but this is mostly syntactic. What ends up happening is that, you know, the compiler is extended by keeping these extra properties and then uh, something, something tries to prove that these things hold. And I'm, I'm gonna talk about how it proves it a bit later. Uh, yeah, somebody was asking, by the way, that, uh, okay, imagine we have division and, and then uh, your second parameter is coming from the internet. How does this, uh, pro how does this handle this? Well, the point is that you, in that case, you still need to handle the problematic case. So you will still need to check whether, you know, is this number zero or not? But once you, have, you are in the branch where you know that X is not zero, then the compiler is aware of this fact and then the rest of the thing, the division is gonna go through. Before you do this, the compiler will say, well, I don't know whether this number is zero or not. I cannot compile this program for you. But once you've done the pattern matching or you have an if or whatever other thing which makes the compiler aware of this thing not being zero, you are good to go. Um, so yeah, and then you can say you can have an IO of not zero integer. Uh, yeah, so I mean, depending on the on the language, these kind of refinement types are first class or not. So uh, uh, in liquid Haskell, for example, you could have them, but only only in the liquid Haskell part. Uh, Haskell would still see an integer. I'm not really sure about how stainless would do that, but yeah. In any case, uh, yeah. They are just normal types. So, okay. Uh, up to now, everything I've shown is kind of cool. You know, we should all use this. Why are not using this? So I, I guess that you know, uh, being being some, uh, you need to tell also the bad things. And and this, this both these approaches have a couple of bad things. So first of all, we have higher order functions. And you know, if you have division, this is all very easy to, to define. Okay, you take two numbers, one shouldn't be zero, and then you get back another integer. Uh, but uh, you know, if you have higher order functions, this becomes messier. And it's not even messier on, on uh, you know, it's not, it's not even a problem of, of that the programming languages don't handle higher order function is that even given what it should be the correct type of a function like map is not easy. So you can say, okay, what is the best type for map? Maybe all you wanna, you want is you have uh, a list of A's and then the result is a list of B's with the same length. Good, but that's one property you care about. I could make something much more complicated. Suppose that you have a function F and a list and then if every element in X satisfies P, some property P, and then the function F uh, is defined in such a way that if P holds, then Q holds, then it should be that the, the result of map should satisfy Q. So this is a more complicated thing. So imagine, I don't know, that uh, I know that if every number is greater than zero, then uh, the result is even. Uh, then it should take a list of non-zero things into a list of even things. So that's a more complicated property that I can say about map. But even that is not the end of the game. What if I care about the relation of two consecutive elements? So, you know, I have an order list where I know that each element is greater than the, is smaller than the previous one. And I have a function which satisfies this condition between every two elements. Map will end up, you know, uh, satisfying this condition too. So this is something else I can care about. Uh, and you know, what if we want to encode something like, if I apply map to ID, I get something like ID. Uh, so all of this is more problematic uh, when we have higher order functions. You know, Having the right specification of a higher order function is much more complicated than specifying a first order function. And, and you see that in many cases, people just end up writing their own recursive functions because of this, because they don't have the right map which has the right kind of information to the, uh, encode it in the types. So you end up writing your own recursive function to ensure that the compiler knows about exactly what you want. 
And then there is a second problem, which is about how you, again, how you model things is the, the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic verification. Because actually, if you are using these this languages, you have two ways to do stuff. Uh, you can satisfy, you can write data types, such as, you know, everything you do is write by construction, otherwise things don't compile. So if, you're, if you write a function like replicate, where the n is part of the type, then, you know, you either write the function and it works and it's correct because the list must have, must have exactly n elements or you don't. But you could also decouple these two things. You could write a replicate, uh, which takes a natural number and says nothing about, you know, about the relation between the number and the list and then have another extra thing uh, which works like a theorem. And, and again, I'm going to talk about theorems and proofs a bit later. Something which says, you know, I'm going to prove to you that the length of replicating is exactly the number given. So the length of replicate n is exactly n. And these things are separate. And uh, what you see is that some properties may be harder in one way or, or may have more effort to convince things in one way. So replicate is the typical example where, you know, the intrinsic verification sort of wins because you just write the function and then it's okay. Uh, but there are other cases where, where things are not so easy. And you also see that some programming languages, uh, so for example, Coq is more geared towards extrinsic verification and Act is more towards intrinsic verification. So uh, this adds, you know, even more possibilities to the mix and more ways to model stuff. So this, I always think this is like a, a problem because there is not one way in which you do stuff. You have to be aware of different possibilities and, you know, have a lot of, have a bit of experience doing things in one way and the other to be able to decide what is the best uh, way to go in some, in each case. So before we move on, uh, there was another question where, uh, which says, does liquid Haskell allow to declare type which enrich normal types with constraints or are just pre and post conditions? So in particular in liquid Haskell, they are actual types with properties. So they are really refinement types. Uh, they, and, and in a stainless, as far as I know, they are also actual types. Uh, just the way we write them looks very much like pre and post condition. And I think this is a good way to understand what's going on, but the types themselves exist. So the type of numbers, which are not zero is a type itself and it's just how we use them in different places, which make it work like a pre or post conditions. Good, so uh, let's move on and let's talk about proofs. You know, that's uh, something you end up, uh, you know, uh, just stumbled upon if you use these things. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, let me show you an example. So imagine I write this terrible definition of reverse. I know it's terribly inefficient, but you would expect this to be, you know, it's the easy definition of reverse. So the compiler should be able to know that this is okay. So I'm saying, well, if I reverse the empty list, I get an empty list. Otherwise I reverse the rest of the list access and then I append the number at the end. If you write this in ACTA, it will tell you I cannot unify n plus 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 one zero with plus one n, which is the computer telling you that I don't know that n plus one is the successor of n. Use, a, use ACTA enough and you think that this is a normal thing for a computer to behave. Like it tells you, I don't know stuff. Uh, but you know, it takes, it takes a lot of time until your brain decides that this is normal. And you know, this, you know, for me, it's just a fact. It's telling you that, that the computers are just uh, stupid and don't know about things we don't tell them. So this is, but uh, you know, in practice, this is, gonna be a problem because you try to write your program and then the, the, lang the programming language, the compiler is sort of asking you to prove very small things which you might not even know to prove. So, you know, if you haven't done proofs uh, before in your life, finding this and being able to convince the compiler that this is correct is actually gonna take you a few days. Uh, but anyway, how, how we overcome this problem is by going back to, you know, Gary Howard correspondence, one of our favorite uh, uh, 
you know, things in the world, which sort of tell you, you know, types are like logical propositions and programs are the proofs of such things, which mean that the type checker works like a proof checker. Or in this case, that if I want to convince the compiler that these things are exactly the same, what I do is write a function. So I just write a function plus one in which I say, you know, given an n, n plus plus one zero is plus one n. And the type, you see the type is encoding the property I want to be able to check. And then writing the proof is just writing a program. So I'm not, I'm not expecting people that haven't seen this to be able to write this program. But the point is that it is a program. It's a program with a very special thing, but you can see that it's sort of just calling functions and calling recursive things. And recursion is actually sort of like the induction you do in mathematics. Uh, just so, uh, see this, I mean, uh, you have this kind of funny things where you say, you know, uh, if I have plus zero, of one so that I'm checking the case zero plus plus one zero should be plus one zero. And then I have, uh, you know, I have something which, which tells me, uh, you know, the compiler in this case is able to see, oh, right, zero plus anything is the anything because I have this in the definition of plus. So I can just, you know, I see it. It's, you know, it's right there on my face. So you use in that case something, something called refl. Uh, and in other cases, you have to work a bit more. So if you want to check the, the, the general case, then you actually need to call yourself recursively, which is kind of doing induction, and then call something ca called congruence, which is says, OK, if these two things are equal, if I apply a function to both of them, this thing, the result of both things must be also equal. So uh, anyway, this is, this is something, if you want to use dependent types, something you, you also need to learn. So, you want to check properties about your programs, and you have to learn how to write proofs about other stuff, usually numbers and things like that. Uh, and by the way, the good thing of this hardcore correspondence is that we cannot only define propositions, is that we can also define new predicates, new things we care about. Uh, and this is, this is you know, how we would do this extrinsic verification I was, I was mentioning before. So you write a function and then you define what you care about and then you, you, you put those things together at some point. Uh, so here I have an example of, of, of a predicate which says that the first number is a smaller than the second number. And uh, it's a bit funny. Again, you have to learn how to write these things, but it's essentially telling you, you know, zero is a smaller or equal than any other number. And that's what LTE zero tells you. And uh, if I have two numbers, m plus m, and n is smaller than n, then n plus one is smaller than m plus one. So why you do this in this way, again, is, is something which you know, can change. You can have many different ways of encoding less than or equal. Uh, but at the end of the day, what is important from here is that if you want to prove that one is smaller than two, then you give a value. You have an actual program which tells you how this is this is the case you know which in this case means take lte zero which will tell you that zero is smaller than one and then use this extra plus to say now that zero plus one which is one is great is smaller than one plus one which is two so this is how you define those things uh and we can even go and prove more properties. So we can have program which says, you know, n is smaller than n, or if we uh, have n and we sum m, this you get, we get something which is greater than the previous thing. So, you know, uh, once we have a way to define properties and a way to define predicates, we can start proving stuff. So you can think, okay, this is not, this is looking quite terrible. So do I need to write all these proofs by hand every time? So there are three answers to this. So Agda says, yes, deal with it. You know, you, you have decided to use it, to use me, and I'm not going to help you at all. So yes, deal with it. Koch, on the other hand, says, you know, you tell me the hard parts, and I'm going to use something called tactics 
which are like predefined ways to prove stuff to prove the rest. So you, you, you know, there are some things which I, I need help. Like when should I do recursion and things like that? I, I cannot handle this in general, but you know, the, the, the boring parts, I'm good with it. And then you have a uh, liquid hazard or a stainless, which says, let me ask my friend set three. And who is set three? You know, a magical oracle of knowledge. Set three is called, it's one example of what it's called a satisfiability, satisfiability model of theory solver. Name doesn't actually ring a bell if you don't know what it's talking about. What it's important is that SMT solvers know a lot about a few things. But these few things come over and over. They are the boring part. They are things about numbers. They are, you know, things like n plus one is the same as one plus n. You know, SMT solver knows, or n plus zero is equal to n. These are the kind of things which it can deal with. Or, you know, if I have an element in a set and then I remove it, then I, don't long, I no longer have it. This kind of, you know, boring things, tricky small things, which, uh, otherwise, you will have to convince the compiler e uh, every time. So, uh, you know, this is also something to keep in mind. There, is, there are ways to make this better. And, and uh, some, of, some programming languages actually have tried very hard to do it better. So, uh, you know, just to end, I would like to give you my personal take, and this is in part what I think how we can move forward and how, how we can start using formal verification. Uh, so I think that refinement types, uh, as of now, they are the tools with less frictions because they are already integrated in languages which we already use, like Scala or Haskell, and they try to automate proofs. And in both cases, in both stainless and liquid Haskell, you can always fall back to the kind of write the proofs by hand style. Uh, so I think this, this gives you the, less, the, the least possible friction right now. Uh, so why are not using them now? You know, let's all write, you know, let's all start using this. Well, that's, that's great. I mean, I would love that we start using this, but keep in mind that uh, all these things can be a bit temperamental, uh, for which I mean sometimes they don't work and you don't know why. And uh, they don't work just because they don't work. You know, why can't it prove it? It's, it's right there. I don't know. And then you change it slightly and then it can prove it. And, you know, that's, that's something which, which people are still working on, how to make sure that when something fails, you have the actual information of why it failed. Uh, but right now, technology is not there. It fails. That's all. And I've been talking a bit about this this difference between intrinsic and extrinsic verification, but that's just like the tip of the iceberg of how to model complex properties. So uh, how we model properties is still like an exploratory business. Uh, so uh, yeah, it might be cases where you think, okay, let's model this in this way. And then you figure out that by modeling it this way, you cannot actually convince the compiler. So what you've done is useless, and you have to use another approach. On the other hand, uh, dependent types are kind of better understood. So uh, there are several books written about Coq, about Idris, about Agda, and I think they are a great tool if you know how to specify your, pro your properties completely and you know from the beginning, or you want to have a model of your things, but uh, right now you need to use another language. So you have this problem in which you're, you have your model in Coq, but then your implementation in a Scala, and you can, kind of try to put them together using tests, uh, but you don't have a proof that your, the code running in production is actually formally verified. You only have a model of it in another language. Uh, but you know, this can take us very far and, and just to you know, keep on with the hype, I wanna share with you a few projects where, where they have been able to do this. So the, you have SEL4, which is like a formally verified microkernel. So which is you know like the smallest part of your operating system, and this has been verified in some other uh, system called Isabel HOL. Uh, somebody has taken the time to write a formally verified C compiler in in COP. Uh, some other people have been doing uh, models of smart contracts at Bitcoin in ACTA, and I recently uh, read that. Uh, 
Microsoft used some other tool called TLA Plus, which is not based on types, but it's you know it's a formal verification tool to define a database with different consistency model, models and prove that all of them were correct. So you know, this proves these 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 tools have already been tested on big things. So it's it's uh, they are not. Uh, you know they are not usual in, in industry, but they have they are being used and they are being used by big players right now. Oh, and somebody mentions in the chat that AWS, uh, Stripe, and other big players use TLA plus. So yeah. Uh, good. So I don't know if there are any more questions at this point. Uh, just otherwise, I'll start with the summary. So I mean, what I've shown is three small examples of how we can have more powerful type systems. So I've shown inductive type with indices, like, you know, what we always call GDTs in Haskell, uh, which are type with describe some properties in their values. Uh, then you have dependent types, which in which the type of the result depends on the value of the arguments. And this implies this kind of weird idea that types and values live in the same world. Then you also have refinement types, which are types recommended by predicates. Uh, and this is, you know, a bit of how type-based formal verification looks looks right now. Of course, I mean, if you start asking, there are many more tools, and you have many other ways to do stuff. You don't even have to use types. Uh, you can use, you know, model checkers. You can use abstract interpretation. There are many other ways. Uh, yeah. So that's it. So that's it.